when you're presented with an opportunity and you're deciding whether you're cut out for it, on one hand, it is helpful to consider past evidence to gauge whether you have the necessary experience, knowledge, and overall capability or skills to decide whether this is something that you can actually deliver on. And past evidence can look like your formal education, training, experience with clients, measurable results or achievements that you've created, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, what if you don't have any relevant experience in this opportunity that you're presented with? In such cases, how will you actually know whether you can deliver on this or not? This is what we'll be looking at in this episode. Now, This episode is part two of a two-part series. So on the previous episode, we explored what to consider when deciding whether or not to say yes to an opportunity, especially if this is something that you feel immediately unqualified for. But what happens after you say yes to this opportunity and you actually now have to deliver on what you promise? This is going to be the premise for part two of this series. So similar to part one, this episode is also going to be centered around my recent experience with co-hosting at the Franchising and Licensing Asia 2024 Expo. So I would recommend listening to part one of the series first before listening to this one. Now, with all that said, let's get into the conversation for today. First, when it comes to delivering on an opportunity that I had just said yes to, I was initially super overwhelmed at the thought of I'm not going to do a good job and worrying about making the the team at the Financial Coconut look bad because of my own poor performance. So whenever I wanted to spiral, I had to ground back to two things. Number one, what is actually required and expected of me from the Financial Coconut team? And number two, what is my own metrics or standards of excellence for this opportunity? When it came to the former, I had to remind myself time and time again that I had agreed to say yes to this because I had already talked to the team and made sure we were on the same page in terms of expectations. I had said yes to co-hosting at FLASIA because I understood the assignment details And I was confident that I could deliver on the assignment. So it was really, really important for me to continuously remember this whenever my anxiety wanted to spin me out. Now, when it came to my own goals or expectations, I honestly, like all I really wanted to do was just do a good job at co-hosting. And if I feel like I did a good enough job, then that will be a successful event and experience for me. But what does that even mean? Like what does good enough look like? So for me, a satisfactory co-hosting performance to me would look like being able to just keep the conversation going so that there were no lulls and having also the sufficient industry knowledge so I can keep the conversation going. On the other hand, an exceptional co-hosting performance would look like number one, the guest is relaxed and they're clearly having a fantastic time chatting with me. Number two, I ask questions beyond the basics, meaning my questions are able to make the guests pause and think. And number three, I am also relaxed and not worrying about how I look or what my next question is, but instead I'm deeply concentrated on what the guests are sharing. So in those moments of anxiety and overwhelm, I needed to constantly ask myself to remember, number one, what is actually required and expected of me. And number two, what are my own metrics or standards of excellence for this opportunity? Because although I may not have direct experience in the subject matter, I do have the skill sets to deliver on the task at hand. And that was immensely encouraging for me to remember because my brain wanted to only latch on to what I was supposedly lacking in rather than also considering the skills that I do have under my belt. And this leads to something major I realized, which is this. When you're pursuing something that feels so out of your comfort zone, your emotions will want to deter you from doing what is needed and required to get the job done or to see progress and improvement in what you're working on. And so the first takeaway I really want to highlight in this episode is this. When you're doing something that is new or putting yourself in 
an environment or opportunity that is meant to stretch you out of your comfort zone, you are going to experience thoughts or emotions that want to keep you from doing the necessary action that is required of you in order to grow or get the job done. That is completely natural. And if anything, you can expect these thoughts or feelings to come up. That said, in such scenarios, I found it absolutely critical to shift my focus, my time and energy into not just evidence that is helpful and grounding, but also to actually do what is needed, right? So in this case, as much as my brain wanted to just wallow in thoughts that made me feel small and unqualified, continuing to indulge in these thoughts, it was just not helpful. And it's definitely not going to help me prepare for FLASIA. So what this meant is that I have to proactively make decisions and take actions that were best for the long term, rather than caving into the thoughts and emotions that make me feel temporarily better in the short term. So here's what I mean. Rather than caving into thoughts like, oh, I should just back out now and not pursue this at all, because honestly, backing out felt a lot more comfortable and safer, right? Instead, I had to continuously ground back into not just thoughts that were helpful, but also continuing to take action that, quite frankly, required a lot of discomfort. Now is not the time to run away from your goals or let your own self-doubts or insecurities dictate whether you grow or step into your next level, right? So stay committed to your plan of action and to the vision for the person that you want to become. That is so important in these moments. So that is lesson number one for this episode. Now, before we look at what lesson number two is, one more thought that came up for me now that I'm looking back is that I'm also very, very impressed that I was so dedicated to delivering what I signed up for, especially since this opportunity isn't necessarily my own. So what I mean is that this three-day live stream is under the financial coconut. This wasn't mine. It wasn't under my brand. I was doing it for someone else's brand. Yet I still cared deeply about doing the best that I could. So what I realized was that the reason why I personally cared so much about doing a good job on behalf of the Financial Coconut team was because I really respect what they have built, right? I really appreciate the relevance and significance of what the Financial Coconut does. And for me, I could also clearly see what the Financial Coconut's mission is. And I was more than happy to be part of that mission and to contribute to it in some way. And that's when it hit me. This. This is exactly what I would love to build as well. I want to build something that is so meaningful and where the mission is so clear, not just to me, but also to my people, so much so that others want to join me in moving this mission and vision forward together. And this was an idea that I was always aware of, but it it didn't really click for me until this event, right? To see it play out in practice, it was, honestly, it was just such an empowering experience. All right, now let's move on to the next few lessons and what actually went down at FLASIA. So over the first two days of FLASIA, I co-hosted the following panels. On day one, I was part of the kickoff welcoming live stream at 10 a.m. And then at 2 p.m., my panel was about developing effective strategies for entering and growing in ASEAN markets. And then at 5 p.m., my panel was about navigating the U.S. market and how local brands in Singapore can overcome challenges when expanding over to the U.S. And then on day two, I co-hosted a panel on digitalization and what it looks like for businesses to implement digital solutions at 1 p.m., And at 2 p.m., the panel was about email marketing for franchises. And then finally, my panel at 3 p.m. was about effective marketing and branding strategies for franchises. So on day one, I arrived at the venue early and started talking to the team at Financial Coconut, who were honestly, they worked tirelessly behind the cameras for all three days at the FL Asia. And I was also really curious about the vendors who had boobs at the expo. And because I was part of the kickoff live stream, Uh, at 10 a.m. on day one, where me and the two other co-hosts would riff back and forth and welcome the audience to the three-day live stream event, I thought it might be helpful to walk around the venue and just check out what was happening. Because I know that we will be talking about what the audience can expect from the live stream and from FL Asia as well. But you know what? 
going up to the booths and striking up conversations with vendors, it was not comfortable at all whatsoever, right? In my head, I was telling myself, I have no idea what to even say or how I would introduce myself, right? Since I'm not in the franchising space. But somehow, I still managed to go up to several booths, introduce myself, ask some questions, and made a few notes in my notebook in case I wanted to bring up certain points during the, the kickoff live stream. And guess what? I'm so glad I did. Like, I'm so glad I walked around and talked to some vendors because in the end, I was indeed able to weave in some of my, my observations and conversations into that kickoff live stream. Another really pivotal moment for me at Ephalasia was also on day one. So what had happened was that the original panelist that I was supposed to interview at the 5 p.m. slot had backed out last minute for whatever reason. So I technically went into day one not knowing whether I even had someone to talk to or interview for the 5 p.m. panel. But you know what happened? For some reason, this girl had the audacity to go around a venue looking for potential guests or experts to interview for my 5 p.m. slot. Because I already knew the kind of guest we would ideally speak to, which is someone who is an expert in expansion to the U.S. So during my downtime after the first panel, I walked around the venue to see who might be potential experts that I could invite to the 5 p.m. live stream. And let me tell you, Although I was extremely determined to find the right fit guest for the 5 p.m. slot, going up to booths to introduce myself, to get to know their work, to suss them out and suss out whether they're a good fit or not and make a potential invitation that was not comfortable at all. But I knew that if I don't even try, then there is a likelihood that the 5 p.m. panel may not even happen. Because realistically, although I knew that it was technically the responsibility of the Financial Coconut team to source the guests, I also saw how stretched they are behind the scenes, right? Like trying to manage all the technical difficulties that were going on in real time. And for me, I cared about doing a damn good job when it comes to co-hosting at FLAsia. And I knew that that wasn't going to be possible if I had no opportunity to actually do the co-hosting. So ultimately... I did what scared me and terrified me, but it paid off. Because in the end, I found an incredible expert to join us for the 5 p.m. session, and we had such an excellent conversation and live stream at that 5 p.m. slot. Now, throughout the next two days on day one and day two, as I continued to co-host the live streams and panels on day one and day two, after every single session, I was very quickly able to identify the specific areas I feel like I could improve on. But you know what? Knowing what I have to improve on, like intellectually, although that's a good thing, what was really fascinating was that actually being aware of my gaps while I was actually delivering on the task, like that was not comfortable at all. And the way I can explain this is that it's like, it's like knowing that you're not like a 10 out of 10 star player in something, but you still have to go back out to the field and play, right? It's very different from knowing that you are like a 9 or 10 out of 10 player and then going to bat for the team, right? If you know that you're a 5 and then you still have to go out there and, and get to work, like that's kind of uncomfortable, right? So for example, one thing that I could see that I could improve on was that I needed to be quicker in my follow-up questions, because what I found was happening was that as I was so processing and digesting what the guests had just shared, my co-hosts would already have something that they're curious about and therefore they would share their thoughts and ask the question before I could even formulate my next thought. And this was an area of improvement I could identify right off the bat after my first and second panels. So as a result, I could feel myself feeling kind of insecure during all my other panels and live streams because in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, Cheryl, think faster, think faster, say something, hurry up, right? And this chatter in the back of my mind, is it's not helpful, right? It's not helpful when it comes to actually listening attentively and really, really processing what the other person has shared. So put another way, I feel like I was unconsciously putting my, my focus on myself and trying to not make myself look bad rather than just focusing on the guests and bringing out the best in them. 
So it was a really interesting scenario, right? It's like a double-edged sword here. Knowing what my gaps are, it will help me improve in the long term. But at the same time, it just felt so uncomfortable right now going into the next live stream and the next one and the next one, knowing that I still have clear areas to improve on and still having to go out there and deliver my best work. So putting together these different examples and stories, you might already be able to extrapolate what the next takeaway I want to share here is, which is you will always have areas to improve on. Like that is inevitable. And these areas will require you to step out of your comfort zone. Like that is part of the growth, which means that growth is inevitably uncomfortable. Now, in hindsight, one more thought that has been coming up for me as I reflect on FL Asia is that I think there are going to be times when people will actually quit because honestly, at the beginning stages, there will be times when things just feel really, really hard, right? And people will think like, oh, I'm just not meant for this. And I understand that more often than not, when we're not good at something like that can really take a toll on how you're feeling, right? And depending on the circumstances, it might even take a toll on your mental health or, the, or affect other areas of your life. But I do think it is important to be able to discern whether a situation is indeed not worth it for you to pursue it anymore versus one that is worth pursuing. But it will require you to stick it out and keep putting in the reps to get better with time and repeated practice. Because if this is an opportunity that you feel is worth pursuing, then I think it is so important to remember and understand that more often than not, our most defining moments or times when we see the biggest growth are those times when it feels so uncomfortable or even really, really hard, especially at the very beginning. But through repeated practice and time and committed efforts, you will get better and better compared to who you were before. And that, in my opinion, that is how growth becomes inevitable. Overall, I'm really, really proud of myself. I'm proud of myself for saying yes to this opportunity. I'm proud of myself for delivering a good performance on both days. I mean, yes, like there were areas that I could improve on, but it doesn't detract how immensely proud I feel. And I also feel proud of myself for blowing my own mind in terms of the growth and capacity that I'm capable of. And what ultimately surprised me about myself through this experience was that Maybe, just maybe, I have been thinking of myself as a tiny little fish in a big ocean. Maybe I have been listening to my self-doubts and insecurities too much, like so much to the point where I not only believe those thoughts inside my head, but I've also been playing small and taking small action because that's how I was seeing myself. And what this experience broke me free from was the thought that unless I have formal education or training or years of experience in XYZ subject matter, then I was not qualified to even talk about this topic. And that is a reoccurring belief or pattern that creeps up in many parts of my own life. For instance, I thought that unless I got a master's degree in a subject, then I should stay in my lane and only talk about what I do have experience with. Right. And how this has manifested in my own career in business is that I have been having the thought of I'm limited in what I can say or do as a business owner because I lack the knowledge and professional experience. Right. So unless I go get some formal tertiary education, I will remain unqualified to speak on this subject. And that's why I continue to like box myself into the confines of coaching side hustlers, solopreneurs, and content creators because I felt like I did not have what it takes to branch out into new areas. Now, that being said, yes, I do have five plus years of experience in terms of coaching side hustlers, solopreneurs, and content creators. So that's for sure one reason why I continue to do what's already working and what I know I'm capable of. But what I'm trying to say here is that I was also unknowingly like not even trying to learn or grow out of my comfort zone, right? I never even asked myself, huh, what are the interests I want to further explore and learn about, right? Like I never even asked myself those questions. I never even considered other opportunities or other business models because I felt 
too afraid to even have conversations with people who are not in the online coaching space or not in the online content creator space because I was so worried about not having the sufficient knowledge to continue a conversation. Now, with hindsight, I can see that, okay, yeah, I was definitely thinking very, very smallly or lowly, I should say, of myself because this experience with FLAsia showed me that, first of all, I have the work ethic and the capacity to learn new things. I have a knack for studying and researching information and deepening my understanding of a topic and to do this effectively and efficiently. And number two, I also showed myself that I have the courage and the audacity to acknowledge that, yes, I might be a total noob, a total beginner, but I'm not going to let that stop me from even trying, right? So here I still said yes, and I still tried. And now my perception of what I'm capable of, it will never be the same. And I hope that you too can recognize your own potential to work hard and do the work that is required of you to deliver on certain opportunities or jobs or tasks. And I hope that you will also see that you can have the courage and the audacity to recognize what your own gaps are and limitations, but not let that stop you from even trying, from doing the work that's necessary to grow and improve in those areas. So for me, when I first looked at who the other co-hosts were for the FLAsia live streams, oh my gosh, I felt so unqualified and so small compared to them. Because most of them, honestly, they seemed like they were much more established than me. They had domain expertise in areas I knew nothing about. And they also just have more experience, like years of experience under their belts. Not to mention some of them are really excellent and charismatic speakers and conversationalists in general. Yet, at the same time, despite these insecurities and self-doubt, I still felt oddly empowered to do an excellent job at FLAsia because I wanted to be an example of someone who at one point also felt so small and not smart enough, not qualified enough to learn about topics like franchising or like other serious business topics. But despite all that, I still took the steps to learn and dive headfirst into the deep end and expand my breadth and depth of knowledge. And the thing is, I know that there are so many people in this audience right now who are just like me, right? Maybe you feel like a total beginner or a total business noob and you don't know anything, but because of your own insecurities, you don't even take the first step to at least try to put yourself in unfamiliar territories. You're petrified to be a beginner and not know what you're doing. But for me, very, very strangely, despite having those experiences myself, I still felt the drive to equip myself with the necessary knowledge and tools as much as possible because I actually genuinely wanted to learn about the subject matter, not because I didn't want to screw up at FLAsia, but I was also becoming increasingly curious about franchising as I continued to study it. And This mindset, it first starts with making the decision to commit to what you're doing and who you're becoming, followed by taking the actions necessary to back up what you've committed to. Because in order to stretch your own realm of possibility and become that next level version of yourself, it starts with committing to doing the work and then actually doing the work, right? And that is the third and final lesson I really want to highlight in this episode. If you want to stretch in terms of the opportunities that you attract or level up in terms of your growth, your skill set, or mindset, the question that comes to mind here is, are you avoiding the work that is necessary as opposed to actually doing what is required of you to grow? And one painfully honest question that I frequently ask myself is, am I currently the version of myself that will attract the opportunities or the clients I would love to work with. And another question that I also like to explore is, am I thinking big enough? Am I sharing a vision that is so compelling for not just myself, but also to others as well, so much so that they want to join me in seeing this vision through? Because ultimately, in order to create more possibilities, more options, and bigger and better opportunities, I have to go first and do the work that's needed to become the version of me that is positioned to welcome and bring in these possibilities, options, and opportunities. So with that, 
That concludes our conversation for today. But before we close out, let's summarize one more time the key takeaways from today's conversation. Number one, when you're doing something new or putting yourself in an opportunity that is meant to stretch you out of your comfort zone, you will experience thoughts or emotions that want to keep you from taking the necessary action that's required of you to get the job done. But in these moments, please continue to ground back into not just the helpful thoughts, but also continue to take the action that feels out of your comfort zone. Stay committed to the plan of action and to the vision for the person that you want to become. Number two, you will always have areas to improve on. That is inevitable. And these areas will require you to step out of your comfort zone. And that is part of the growth, which means that growth is inevitably uncomfortable. And lastly, the formula for leveling up is pretty straightforward. In order to stretch yourself and your realm of possibility and become the next level version of yourself, it first starts with committing to doing the work and number two, actually doing the work required of you, right? In order to create more opportunities, bigger, better ones, you have to go first and do the work that's needed to become the version of yourself that's positioned to bring in these possibilities, options, and opportunities. All right, that is all for us for this episode and for this two-part series. So with that, thank you so, 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 so much as usual for listening to this podcast, and I'll see you all in the next one. Sounds good? Awesome. Let's get to work.